being on BET, on Rap City, and that making you a household name, what was that like? And how was that experience for you when you went from, you know, doing your dance to being recognized on the street as Big Les from Rap City? It was crazy because before Rap City, they'd be like, <clears throat> aren't you the girl who dances? And nobody knew my name. It's, and it's the silhouette or the body frame that was the most recognizable, even from behind. And I couldn't understand how that happened. And um, then it would be like, yo, Laz, yo, Laz. And that would be great. And then people would call me the wrong name because Donnie Simpson would call me Big Legs as opposed to Big Les. And so people would call me Big Legs. And I was like, I didn't even care. The fact that you even watched the show and you got cable in the hood or even Pookie and them hooked you up with the black box, it didn't matter. I just was happy that you guys, you know, recognized me and stuff. But you you want to be recognized for doing good work, not just because I don't need um, how some people need to be like the star of the show. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. I kind of want to leave, leave a legacy of respectability and, and historical moments and movement throughout this industry. And so that's kind of been my goal. So to be appreciated or looked at with that is, is a great thing. Artists like Tupac and Biggie, being able to interview them early on in their careers, what was that like moving the culture forward at that time and putting them on a platform to where the world could see them? And it's a platform that everybody's tuned into. So you know that this interview is gonna mean a lot to these artists careers. Oh man, it's nerve wracking. It's, it's pressure upon pressure upon pressure because what you don't see is like the other 30 people that are in the room, not just like their crew, but the other producers and stuff like that. And half the time, sometimes there's an IFB uh, in your ear where your producer's talking to you, the cue cards, the teleprompter, this, that, and the other. So you have to pay attention to so many things as well as listen to the artists. And you recognize the streets are bubbling. This is going to be a, an interview that's going to change your career. So you better come with it. And so you know, I'm somebody who by nature is really inquisitive and interested in the journeys of other people. So I didn't really need a lot of the times the, you know, cue cards or notes and stuff like that, unless it was something important I really had to say or a specific name. Um, so me asking me these questions were really genuinely because I was interested in what it was that they were bringing and, you know, what this was going to be like not to, you know, not to ask the general questions or the generic questions that I've asked 20,000 other people. So, and it was hard back then because a lot of times artists did or didn't have artist development. And so they'd just be like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? We just keep it real. You know, we just represent the hood. We just keep it real. And it's just like, okay. But thank God, Tupac, <laughs> yeah, Tupac and Biggie were like prolific enough, you know, with their vernacular and their thought process to really share their emotions about what was going on, not just in the studio and on the record, but bringing real life to their lyrics and talking about that journey and what it means for Black people and what it means for hip hop and all that stuff. So, As a journalist in those spaces, what were the times that you really felt like you was just doing your thing and you knew that that interview was just going down? Uh, um, well, two things that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just told this story in an interview before. I grew up with... Um, Kid and Play, mm. DJ Wiz, uh, Herbie Lovebug. We're all from East Elmhurst. So we all went to like junior high school, high school, elementary school together. Our siblings all went to school together and stuff. So I knew them. So I'm interviewing Kid and Play. And the thing you have to do is pay, you're so focused. And this is in the very, very beginning of my career of the questions that are on the paper that you don't listen. Mm. And so I hear them talking. I'm just making sure I get my questions out. But Play had already answered three of the questions that are already on here, but I didn't listen to him. So I asked one of the questions. He's like, you didn't hear me. I just answered that. And he really shut me down. Like, and I'm going, dang, I was hurt. Cause I was like, he's my friend. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? He's right. And it will never, ever, ever happen again. Let me step my game up. So that was, that was one thing. And then two was just, um, uh, you know, having to do interviews like, Aaliyah and R. Kelly, for instance, mm. um, where, you know, I'm privy to a lot of the information in the stories because I'm in the mix. I've been on tour with R. Kelly, you know, I, I and there are people I know who knew, who know, who whatever. And then when you have those meetings about don't ask, don't say, don't whatever. But then you have this moment where it's like, if it's not me, it's going to be somebody else. And me and Brett Walker had to make a decision. Like, we're going to ask this question. Depends on how you ask it. So we'll I'll ask it a little playfully so that they don't feel offended or like blow up on, you know, camera. And they were already prepared and toyed with us, whatever what the answer was to. But there was a time also 
I, inter I interviewed Eminem really quick. I was doing something for Source Magazine, Red Carpet Source Awards in LA. And so he came up uh, to do an interview and he was one of those interviews that was very, yes, no, yes, <laughs> no. And I felt like he just was so overwhelmed with how everybody was fiending after him. And he had been in the trenches for so long. And he's like, now everybody's on my ass. Like now you all want me. And that he was kind of pissed about that, mm -hmm. having to do the interview. Like it just, or what, maybe he was having a bad day. Something happened before he got to me. I don't know, but it went, it was cold as ice. And as a journalist, you kind of have to fill in the spaces and the time or try and make it, you know, give you a non yes or no question. Well, and, uh, yeah, it really was full and teeth. He just wasn't having it. So it was kind of like we cut it short and I felt like that was a missed opportunity for me and for him. But, you know, what can you do? When it came to people like Tupac and Biggie and a lot of the other artists that you interviewed, who were the artists that surprised you to become icons later on after those interviews that you really didn't see it at that moment? It was just another day you at work and then you turn around and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't know you were going to be the greatest of all time. Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, it's interesting because, let me think. I don't know if I'm super surprised at certain artists because usually you can recognize star power in people. And even if you don't see it like, and I hate to use it with this group because they're my friends, right? Everybody's my friends. But the way that you look at the Fugees, right? And you can see through the screen, how Lauren has this essence and you can see with Wyclef and everybody sleeps on Praz, even though Praz has it like, but everybody slept on Praz. So you kind of, there's levels of that shine that people have when they walk in the room that you just kind of know. I think for me, it's the opposite of who I thought was great and they weren't getting their right shine uh, was at first was for me was common. I always thought that Common was the truth, prolific, intelligent, and it took him a minute because he was like an underground artist for a very long time. And he's just now, you know, between all the Oscars and stuff he's won and everything else with the film work, showing you what he's made of, even though those of us who have been riding with him have seen it, it took a minute for the rest of the world to grab on. And I'm glad that they have because he, he deserves it more than anybody I know. When you think about that 90s hip hop era, you know, a lot of folks call it the golden era. What was it like being in the mix with so many talented folks from so many different regions at one time? It honestly felt like being on a college campus. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like we were all dreamers of the same kind. We were all the cool kids. We all had our different styles and our different stilos, like the dancers were over there and everybody wanted to hang with the dancers. The freestyle MCs were over there and everybody wanted to be over there with them. All the people who like rock with the magazine, Source, Vibe, Honey Magazine, everybody hung out with, you know what I'm saying? Like the editors, but you all knew that all of us went to school together or at least it felt like it, right? Mm -hmm. And that we all, this one became the editors, this one became a and the record label, this one became the head choreographer, like it, it all felt like we were in camp together, you know, and that's when the 90s, like everybody had a, a corporate car. So we were all with this, the chows, we were here, we were flowing, the parties were hot and sexy. Like you can't imagine there's nothing like it. Um, and the music was sustainable. Like to me, I don't want to sound like some old cranky stuck in the 90s person. Like I love hip hop all day, every day, yeah. but hip hop then was so infectious and sustainable and memorable and always took you to a place in time in your life. I think it's disposable hip hop now, probably because the singles come out so fast. Half the time you can't really understand the mumble rap and I feel like I need <laughs> um, a translator subtitles or something, you know, um, and the beats are dope. Some of the artists are really dope, but there's very few and far between that make me feel something the way it did in the 90s, you know, so. When Tupac and Biggie started beefing and then you look up and then Tupac passes first, what was going through your mind at that time when everybody started to realize that it was getting real in the field? Oh boy. <clears throat> well, it's always been real in the field. And I guess it's somebody from me who's from New York who went to Latin Quarter and saw all the fights in the rock scene, Roseland and all those old school clubs. So it wasn't nothing new, mm -hmm. but I think because 
I was so close to being around gang members, mm -hmm. which wasn't a part of like the East Coast, the East Coast way, and being at the Source Awards that that day that Suge got on stage and all you, you know, who want, want your uh, executive to be on stage and you could feel the tension in the audience. Mm -hmm. And that is like, let me find out where the exit is because I need to, you know, and both of them being my friends or having, and not even friends, friends, but like having a really good relationship with them yeah. was heartbreaking because there are sides of them that people don't know or didn't get to see, mm -hmm. right? We all, people always say, yeah, Tupac was really smart, but no, he was really brilliant. Mm -hmm. Really, 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 really brilliant and very, very aware. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt like he always felt like he had something to prove and God forbid that everybody would take his handsome looks or his intelligence for weakness. So he always had to be like on the extra up and up, you know? And then I think with Big, it was like him trying to leave the streets behind. And now you're here, you're with Puff and you're with Bad Boy and everybody's trying to claim their territory, you know, as you do in hip hop, cause it's a bravado sport, to, you know? Um, but there are also so many other things too that happen behind the scenes, right? You know, that, <laughs> without saying so much, you know, where other women are involved and, you know, men will break out of prison over yeah. some, over some snatch and become a whole thing, you know, empires have tumbled over the kitty, like, you know, mm -hmm. it's just crazy. And it was just heartbreaking because these two guys were really poets and dreamers and trying to change their lives. But, you know, the ego is a powerful thing and nobody wants to back down and, um, Sometimes it's not even the artist, it's the people around the artist, mm -hmm. right? You roll up to the club and Tupac could be standing there and the boys behind will be like, yo, don't you know who we are to security? Don't you know who this is? Blah, 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 blah. And the artist is just standing there. And now you got to worry about how to manage your friends and, and the people around you. And it's like, cause they're quick to be like, oh, you changed. And it's not like, I didn't change, they changed. You yeah. know what I mean? You're just in the trenches trying to do what you do. Um, so it was just heartbreaking to see it go to that level I think it um, forced people to fall back a little bit, like even with like dissing people on records, because now it's like we're not, we're taking it to the streets. It's not just even fun banter like back in the day with Kumo D and all of them, you know, going at each other. So um, it was heartbreaking, but it was a reality check for sure.